Yes, and uh, you can go down to St. Stephen's, or this is St. Stephen's. But anyway, <laughs> we can move right on to uh, Miss Adriana O'Regan. We are very privileged to have Miss O'Regan join us. Uh, she is a member of the patient, the public engagement committee, uh, and she is here to share her personal perspectives on this topic. She is a former bariatric surgery patient who has experienced firsthand the uh, stigma that seems to face people living with obesity. Won't you please join me in welcoming Ms. Adriana O'Regan. A stool. Thanks, Ted. So I decided when I was doing my presentation that I was going to kind of put it along the lines of my patient has lost weight, now what? So um, basically I have nothing to disclose, no, nobody's paying me to do anything, I'm not affiliated with anybody except for any organization, well besides Klein, but they don't support us in financial means. Other ways, yes. <laughs> so when a patient loses some or all of their weight, excess weight, does anything really change? Yes, their body mass gets smaller, but what about anything else? So we'll look at myself and see if there is a difference. Since my bariatric surgery in July of 2010, the more self-realization I have gained, or maybe it's a bit because I'm a bit more mature, not too sure to be honest. In Christmas of 2015, I landed in the hospital after a pretty nasty fall on my stairs at home. For three days, I was at the mercy of the EMS team that came to take me to the hospital, the ER staff, and then the other nurses and staff and doctor that were assigned to me when I was on the unit. I didn't experience weight bias from everyone or even half of the professionals that I had interacted with, but I experienced it just enough that it left a bad taste in my mouth and made me wonder how others who may, or, who may not be aware of certain policies and procedures handle the same bias that I had dealt with. But before I get into all of that, let's talk about my story and then I will come back to some of my more recent revelations and experiences that I've had. Growing up, I lived with my mom, stepdad, and two older brothers. My, parent, or my mom married my stepdad when I was four, and my biological father was in and out of my life. He seemed kind of to prefer my two older brothers to me. I first remember noticing weight in general when I, was a, when I went to spend more time with my biological father's parents. I would look at my nana, and I, she and I thought, literally, she walked with a pillow in her pants. The second time, I was over at my grandparents' house, and I noticed a scale. I recall weighing myself. I believe that I weighed about 70 pounds and I was at seven years old, but I didn't really know what that had meant. There are other things that I noticed growing up. My parents would try to restrict what I was eating, so I would sneak off to the store to buy food or junk food, really. Family meals were pretty much non existence, takeout was pretty much the norm. My mom also had severe depression and was in, full pajama, was in pajamas for days at a time. My stepdad was constantly working and my brothers had their own friends and didn't want their little sister hanging around. One of my brothers had a big anger problem and would beat me almost daily. Um, so I was left to my, on my own a lot. Uh, so I, just, I had pretty much one friend and we would explore and kind of just hang out. As I got bigger in size, more people tried to help. I would have, I was babysitting and the parent would garner my wages so to pay for the Weight Watchers membership that I had to attend to. I'd be told of the latest, great lo latest and greatest weight loss secret and everyone knew something that I, did, that I wasn't doing and I had to have started yesterday. Besides depression, my mom was also considered obese had diabetes, high blood pressure, and a bunch of other health conditions. She also had a heart attack when she was 41. I was in grade 12. When I was 18, 
I went to my family doctor and asked to be put on the pill, put on pills that, that were to help me lose weight. The ones where you literally put, where you would poop out the grease, the literally, literally grease, they're so gross. Other professional advice was few and far in between with little help or given success, including dietitians and seeing other physicians. The pills were little success and I continued to gain weight. After I graduated high school, I lived, I lived my life and didn't let my weight or height stop me to an extent. I still went on road trips. I walked the Las Vegas Strip, Hollywood Boulevard, saw friends and hung out. Dating, that was another story. I decided that no one wanted to date the pub girl. Um, but that was my sense of, that was my self-given label. I give, I give to you. I also had a sense of, sense of security. If no one wanted to date the fat girl, then no one would definitely want to harm the fat girl or, or would want to rape or physically harm the fat girl. Walking alone in strange places, for example, Hollywood Boulevard in the middle of the night, not an issue. They were never a concern for me. Towards the beginning of 2008, I decided that enough was enough with my weight, and I went to see my family doctor to get a referral to what was known as a weight wife clinic at the Royal Alexandria Hospital in Edmonton. My mom had also attended the weight wife clinic with the expectation that she would have bariatric surgery and that would be all, the cure to all of her conditions and issues. Well, she was denied surgery, and because of that, I decided that if I was accepted into the clinic, I was not letting her know. My mom has since been into the clinic again and has also been told that surgery is not an option for her due to health, due to health reasons. My first appointment was in March of 2009. By that time, I was office administration for two different furnace cleaning companies. I was doing respite for four to five times a week, including weekends, for my parents' foster child that was special needs and nonverbal, as well as attending classes at the University of Alberta in the evenings for sign language and deaf studies. At my first appointment, I was nervous and didn't know if I would be accepted into the clinic. I was, and off I went on this new weight loss journey. By that time, my best friend was getting married in the summer, and I had to wear the dreaded bridesmaid's dress. I went dress shopping with the girls, and she picked out what would work best for all of us. I ordered the biggest size, praying that it would fit, and it did. Barely. The sales associate told me that I was good, as long as I didn't gain any more weight. The dress had to be altered, so I contacted my stepmom, who at the time, or who is a seamstress, to help. I'm not too sure what happened, but honestly, the dress looked worse than what it did before alterations were made. I looked and I felt like I was bulging in and out of the dress. By February 2010, I had an appointment to see one of the surgeons at the Weight Wise Clinic to look at having bariatric surgery. I knew that there was no way in God's green earth that I, was having, that I wanted a lap band, and I was a little bit iffy on having a gastric sleeve. I felt that the best option for me was the RNY gastric bypass. My surgeon agreed, and in May, I signed the papers to go ahead with surgery. I had my surgery on Tuesday, July 13, 2010. I went home to recover, on the Friday and did nothing but throw up. I took my medication as prescribed. I would sleep for about an hour and lay in bed or sit on the toilet while I waited for it was time for me to take my next dose. That Sunday night, I knew that there was something wrong. I felt it. My mom and my aunt, who was a retired RN, called upon to the unit that I was at, staying at, at the Alex, and apparently they were told to take me to a different hospital because it was a five hour wait in the emergency. So we went to a healthcare center, up to the triage nurse, explained how I was feeling, what was happening, and that I had just finished having bariatric surgery less than a week ago. She looked at me, looked kind of up and down, and said, yeah, your body's throwing up because you need to lose weight. She did not admit me. That was pretty much her response. And I'm like, okay. I'm sure that's why I just finished having surgery, to add one more tool to help me lose more weight. I would probably lose some more weight. I slowly wobbled because I was in so much pain. Back to the car and returned home to throw up even more, including everything in my bowel. Monday morning, six days after my gastric bypass surgery, 
I went back to the Weight Wise Clinic to be checked out by my surgeon. After tests were ordered and results came back, I was sent up to the OR for an emergency surgery. For no reason, my bowel blew up to the size of a balloon. And I was admitted into the hospital with laparoscopic incisions and then after that surgery, full open incisions that became infected for three weeks and included a three day e um, ICU stay. I was alone. I knew no one besides my aunt by marriage that had bariatric surgery and hers was 10 years previous. I didn't know what to expect or how to deal with everything. I was at a complete loss. Through some research online, I found a support group that was based in Edmonton, the Edmonton Bariatric Support Group. I really wasn't alone. I started to get involved with them and to learn of other people's experiences with weight loss and surgery. Towards the end of 2011, I was pretty involved in the support group and was still attending the Weight Wise Clinic. During one appointment there at the Weight Wise Clinic, I saw a poster asking for models for a photo shoot. I emailed the contact and attended the very first photo shoot for the Canadian, Canadian Obesity Network's Image Gallery. They were starting up the Image Gallery to help combat weight bias, starting with one photo at a time. Media and others who wanted certain pictures would be able to access them online for free of charge and the pictures were to be showcased with people living with excess weight in a positive light. It's no longer the headless torso picture of a fat person eating a hamburger. I was so impressed with what they were doing that I was willing to help out with whatever was needed. One photo shoot led to two, and then three, and so on. As the photo shoots gained media attention, the request for my opinion or experience also came in. I was, was and still am more than willing to share my, um, share my opinion to, change, to help change the perceptions of people with, that live with excess weight. I have met some people that have great understanding of excess weight, even if they don't battle it themselves, but I've also met people that have the worst view of people living with obesity. It goes more than thinking that just if someone stopped eating junk, thing, junk food and moved more, the weight would just fall off. People with obesity are lazy to the extreme and there's no way that we are going to help to get help to be helped and co all comorbidities are their fault, which obviously is not true. So I will continue to partner with Klein in whatever way they needed, as I believe in their beliefs and mission statements. If I can help others, if I can help others that have excess weight to see that they're not alone, everything is worth it. So then I've lost the weight. Yay. Good for me. But what was that really the only thing that has changed? No, not in the least. I deal with chronic pain and nausea. I have, plus a few other health issues that have presented themselves after surgery. Um, a quick example was, I was just with my three-year-old nephew over the weekend before I came to the summit. And I'm taking my medication and he looks at me and he's like, what, auntie, what's all that medication for? Like, what are these? And I was like, well, these are all for auntie's stomach. And none of these meds I've ever had to take before I had surgery. I have extra skin that is bothersome and sometimes prevents me from doing certain mm. things. But since I've had surgery, I'm not restricted nearly as much as I was before. I still question if I can do something. Uh, swimming with the dolphins a few years ago, I was scared that I would hurt the dolphin. I look at chairs to see if I would still fit. And there are other things that I do without a moment's hesitation. Friends have had to tell me to stop wearing a seatbelt extender, among other things. Remember how I said the weight, my, that my weight or height didn't stop me from doing th sorry, things to an extent? Well, that is true. It didn't let me stop me from road trips, going to the gym, and hanging out with friends. I, didn't let, I did let it stop me from going on airplanes. I did that when I was 16, and then not until I had lost about 100 pounds. I let it stop me from go, from doing different physical activities with friends or going on sports teams. I always thought I wasn't good enough. The biggest thing that I let it stop me was dating. Again, I didn't think date anybody would date the fat girl. That has changed, but it took a really long time. I didn't start dating until about two years ago, actually right before the last Klein Summit in Toronto. To be honest, dating has not been easy for me. Um, I'm not used to the loss to lots of the physical aspects of it or even the positive comments that on my looks that I seem to get. My little brother, the one that was my the, the one that was foster that I get arrested for, 
passed away suddenly in Canada Day of 2015. And dealing with that is, defi is definitely di different since I can't use the same coping mechanism that I did before surgery. I now do these presentations and absolutely love doing them. I work with high school special needs students and again, absolutely love that. Each day is new and there literally is never a dull moment. Uh, working with these students have taught me a lot about my health now and I know that I would never have been able to work with these students when I was 360 pounds. A lot of reasons is because physically, I wouldn't be able to keep up with them, especially when somebody decides to bolt or attack themselves or somebody else. There's also a lot of bending and lifting that has required. But we also walk and get out, get out, about, get out and about daily, and it doesn't matter, matter what the Canadian Weather Guide says. There's a lot that, more that has changed with your patient before they lose weight, at, um, before, after they have lost weight, before their weight, except for their waist size. Look at some of the journey I have shared. Yes, I have physically shared, it changed now that you can see. Do it work as a photo? Uh, there we go. Now you can, uh, as you can see by the photos, um, but there's also been a huge mental shift in my thinking as well. I respond to situations differently. I don't put myself in certain situations like I, like I did before. For example, running the Edmonton River Valley. I would do that, I will do that during the day, but I won't do it at night now. My go-to reaction when bad news hit was to grab the ne nearest item of junk food and ignore my feelings or run away. Yes, I may want to still have that response and sometimes do, but I try to process the information before I do any type of gut reaction. So from a personal perspective, more than just a change in the simple and unrealistic BMI me measurement has resulted from my weight loss and journey. Relationships are different, friendships as well. Going out to eat is different. Airplane rides, emotional responses, physical responses, basically my weight loss and bariatric surgery became a package deal and is not just a smaller body mass. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks, Adriana. I, I have a question, and uh, it was, struck me when you were chatting that even as somebody who is uh, involved in the care of patients with obesity, pre- and post-surgical patients, I don't always hear the whole story. And I wonder, pre-surgically, and in your experience with WeightWise, do you feel that the people who worked with you were they able to hear this whole story during the journey? Because I, I wonder, and I, I don't know about the other practitioners in the audience, you know, how many of us really do, despite efforts or despite our appointments, get the sort of depth of understanding of a person's personal story during the time that they're caring for that patient? Um, you know what, no. They didn't get my entire, they didn't get my story. Um, some of them got a little bit. Um, some did, like my nurse who I would spend a bit more time with, um, he ended up getting a bit of my story, but other than that, and so that part was hard because it seemed to them, I was doing, I was doing fine until I, after I had surgery and then they were like, you know what, no, I think we need somebody for you to talk to because you're not dealing with this properly. So I don't, I think it's something where and also I think it depends on the patients and how much, because somebody going in, because of the weight bias, tends to feel very shameful. And so they don't know what to say and they don't know, a lot of the times they don't know how to explain it. And they're, ex they're honestly, most of them are probably expecting to get shamed for being overweight or obese or I had it, um, one example was, I was supposed to meet with my surgeon and I, he wanted me to lose a little bit more weight before I could have surgery. And I ended up, I was doing everything right, everything right. And I gained a pound. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And his nurse told to me, turned to me and said, well, you're wasting his time, go. And so I was like, okay, good to know. So I, I don't think people get the full story, no.
Thanks, Adriana. So our next speaker is Marie-France Langlois. Uh, Dr. Langlois, she is uh, an endocrinologist and she's the director of the Ambulatory Metabolic Unit, uh, which includes diabetes, obesity, and lipid disorder clinics, and the medical manager of the chronic disease trajectory at the CIUSSS de l'Estrie uh, <laughs> in Sherbrooke. Please, uh, uh, everybody, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Langlois. Thank you, Yoni. Uh, let's try to get my presentation up. Let's go. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Practice my English again. Uh, I'm lucky I was there since yesterday, so I got a chance to chat uh, with some of you uh, since then to get the English cassette going. Uh, and I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss uh, weight maintenance with lifestyle intervention with you this morning. So here are my uh, disclosures. You can see that I work uh, mainly with uh, commercial uh, industry in the area of obesity, diabetes, and thyroid cancer. And uh, like Yoni said, I'm the director of chronic disease at the Sius de l'Estrichus, which is the new healthcare organization that uh, we have in our region uh, since 2015. Uh, however, this program did not uh, get, I think, commercial support. And I have tried to uh, mitigate potential bias by using evidence-based uh, data that, that I will show you uh, this morning. So our objectives for the next 20 minutes will be to uh, be better able to describe long-term changes favoring weight regain after weight loss. Since I was uh, in the first speakers, I thought that this would be a good idea to set the table for uh, Marie-Philippe and, and uh, Sean and then discuss lifestyle intervention strategies that can limit weight gain, weight regain after weight loss. Why are we here? You know that uh, we're facing an obesity epidemic in Canada and the last uh, measures of the Canadian Health Measures Survey shows that it's still continuing to grow with 28% 20, uh, of uh, the population with a measured BMI of more than 30. And this costs a lot of money to our healthcare system uh, in Quebec, uh, we evaluated that in 2011, it was 10% of the consultation and hospitalization cost directly attributable to obesity. What's even more worrisome is the striking greater increase in class two and three obesity. So patients who have more uh, chances of getting health-related condition. And I know I'm preaching to the convinced, but you know that obesity is a very complex disease. Of course, there are individual determinants, biological, genetics, individual food intake and physical activity and psychology, but also the society around us, the food production environment, the built-in environment, societal influence also greatly uh, affect, I think, the weight of the population. If we go back to the individual biology, it would be very simple to say, and I think a lot of doctors uh, unfortunately do that, it's just a question of energy in and energy out. But we have to realize that there is a complex regulation of this energy in and energy out. A lot of it takes place in the central nervous system, in the hypothalamus and cortex and is influenced by many tissues in the periphery from the adipose tissue, pancreas, the gut. You, you will hear this week about the microbiome if you have not already, genetics and epigenetics, but also medications that we prescribe and influence weight. This is all influenced by the environment. People will say we're facing an obesity ep epidemic, but the genetics of the population didn't change, but the interactions with the environment sometimes can produce weight problems. Also influenced by our hedonic inputs, it's a pleasure in life to eat, and our bio biology will favor that. And on the energy expenditure side, we know that the, the biggest accounts are, is, are our basic metabolic rate, but also non-energy uh, activity thermogenesis, so the things that we do in our daily lives that is not planned exercise. 
A variety of hormones influence appetite and satiety. The main appetite uh, regulator is ghrelin produced in the stomach that will produce hunger and desire to eat. But also we have a variety of hormones that will produce satiety uh, produced in the gut, like incretin hormones, also leptin in the adipose tissue, amylin, insulin, and pancreatic polypeptide will also have an influence on our society level. When we lose weight, it results most of the time from caloric deficit, and this can happen from, from different interventions. And we used to say that a caloric deficit of about 3,500 calories would produce one pound weight loss. It, it's been revisited, and it's not exactly one pound, but that's something that's, uh, that was in the wide literature. However, we do attain a plateau after weight loss. Why don't we continue to lose weight if we are in caloric deficit? And this is due to reduced energy expenditure, in part, Physical activity expenditure, if you lose 20 pounds, it's like if you have a backpack and you remove 20 pounds, when you go up the stairs, of course, this will take less energy. Your basal metabolism will go down, especially if you lose muscle mass that people lose when they lose weight. There are also adaptation and compensation mechanisms that can account for 15 to 20 percent of the basal metabolic rate, and I invite you, I think Eric Doucet is giving a talk later this week on that subject. And there are much, much, much inter-individual variations. If you subject 10 people to the same caloric restriction, their response will be very different, even in a controlled environment. I wanted to show you uh, examples of the metabolic adaptations. You all know probably av about the biggest loser TV show. Uh, NIH researchers evaluated 14 of 16 biggest loser participants and they followed them for six years to see what happened. So I know this is very small. I don't want you to uh, look at every number. What I wanted to outline is that they lost a lot of weight during the intervention which is kind of a boot camp, and I never really watched the whole episode, so I cannot tell you m a lot about it, but uh, participants started with a BMI of 49.5, they decreased to 30.2 after 30 weeks, and six years later, they had regained a lot of the weight, but still were lower than to start with at 43.8. What strikes me when I look at this data is that they really increased physical activity, and I think that's one of the things that they do during the intervention. So they went from 5.6 to 10 kilocalories per kilo per day of physical activity. And you see that they successfully maintained that. Even six years later, they did a change in the lifestyle and they continue to be more physically active. However, if you measure with state-of-the-art measures their basic metabolic rate, and you compare that to predicted basic metabolic rate using different calculations, you see that the calculations are pretty good at baseline. It's off a little bit after 30 weeks, so you see that their predicted BMR is higher than they're actually measured, but it's, it even gets worse with time. So there seems to be real true adaptations after weight loss. We also, the patients losing weight will experience hunger increases following caloric restrictions. You've probably all seen uh, this data from Sumitran. After a very uh, intensive diet intervention, patients had lost a mean of 14% of their weight. And then they did meal tests. So you can see at baseline that if you have a meal, you start from a hunger level and hunger decreases, which is normal, after you ate, and then come back slowly. After the diet, you see that you're more hungry to start with, to start the day, and the hunger decreases less. Same thing a year later, even if patients had regained part of the weight. So there seems to be adaptations in our hunger control that will try to have you regain back the weight you lost. And this is paralleled, and I won't go into the detail, with changes in ghrelin and incretin hormones that will favor hunger and satiety. So it's very difficult to adhere to a diet or to something that you cannot continue over time because it's too restrictive. And you can see here a study uh, published in uh, JAMA in 2005 comparing different types of diets. And what the study showed mainly is that 
you get similar weight loss long, long term with the different types of diet, but adherence is really hard if you're going on a diet to lose weight. Only 25% of participants maintained an adherence of 6 out of 10 at the end of the study. And of course, the more you follow the diet, the more you will lose weight. But is that a sustainable approach? I don't think so. So our physiology will favor weight regain when we lose weight. So incretin hormones decrease, ghrelin increase, insulin decreases, leptin decreases. All of this will produce hunger and desire to eat, thus maybe shifting the balance to increasing energy intake, but also resting activity and energy expenditure goes down, which also will favor regain of the weight. So for this first part, I think uh, we should uh, remind ourselves that weight regulation is very complex and influenced by individual and societal factors but also that weight loss induces compensatory mechanisms that favor re weight regain, like decreasing energy expenditure, decreasing appetite, and food intake also. But we're not doomed, <laughs> because this is can be seen as very pessimistic, you know. <laughs> it's impossible to lose weight and keep it off, but I think it's possible. You are, it's a question also of redefining success. So in a lot of studies and in clinical practice, we put a lot of emphasis on the weight loss phase. Uh, and this we're not going to talk about today. But I think what's most important is if you lost some weight, to find a way to go into weight maintenance. And for most of the patients that I ca take care of with them, uh, I think it's important to, from the get-go, think about what permanent changes you're able to do. And also, as time goes by, we, we do have to remember that the natural evolution of weight in adults is to gain about 0.7 kilos per, per year. So even if you would just stabilize the weight, it would be some, some gain. What about long-term weight loss maintenance? Uh, this is a meta-analysis that was published by France in uh, uh, 2007. So they looked at 80 studies with a follow-up of at least one year. Uh, with different kinds of interventions. So you see up here is uh, advice alone, so not very effective, but at least the participants didn't uh, regain, they didn't lose, but they didn't gain weight over a four-year period. You can see exercise alone, we don't have a lot of long-term data, but in general the data says that you could lose a lot of weight, except if you do a greater volume of uh, physical activity, you will not get great weight loss, but usually it's pretty well maintained. Uh, diet alone, you see here in blue. So you, you see that you have greater weight loss, around four or five kilos, and weight maintenance. And what seems to be more effective in terms of uh, lifestyle would be diet and exercise combined. This is the green, uh, the green line, so you have greater weight loss, some weight regain. But look, that on the long term, at four years, patients are, are still better off than they were to start with. And I will leave Marie-Philippe uh, and Sean talk about uh, the, the medications and meal replacement part. If we look at some studies that were done with lifestyle modification on the longer term, I really like the look ahead study. More than 5,000 people with type 2 diabetes and obesity, and they underwent lifestyle interventions. Some of them had meal replacements also. Uh, compared to diabetes education. So you see in red the evolution of the, the weight of people uh, on the diabetes education. They still lost quite a good amount of weight, lifestyle intervention, more weight loss, weight maintenance. They increased the physical activity. They decreased their waist circumference. Uh, they also uh, improved diabetes control. They had no difference in cardiovascular events compared to the diabetes education group. However, they had less medications and uh, improve uh, healthcare costs. If we look now at the look at participants who lost at least 10% of their weight during the initial one year intervention. So these are people who were good responders to the type of intervention that was provided to them. So 16% of the participants, and you look at them on the long term, you can see very good weight loss maintenance with continued lifestyle intervention. 65% of them after eight years would be 5% below their initial weight or lower. And what are the predictors 
of uh, this type of response. So those who maintain the 10% weight loss compared to those who initially lost weight but regained, they have an increased physical activity level, decreased caloric intake, and frequent weight monitoring. So monitoring also seems to be a good thing. If we look now at uh, success strategies in weight loss maintenance, I think a good uh, uh, registry is the National Weight Control Registry. It comprises 3,000 Americans uh, since the mid-1990s. They lost a minimum of 13.6 kilo, and they maintained it for at least one year. And they signed consent, they, they um, fill out a lot of questionnaires, and uh, investigators look at different strategies that help people maintain their weight. So a decreased caloric intake again, low fat diet, 24% fat intake uh, as a mean, ICHO diet, only 1% of the participants with weight loss maintenance had used a low carb diet, having breakfast, avoid avoiding energy dense food, moderate physical activity for at least 60 minutes per day, and regular monitoring of weight and behaviors were strategies that was associated with long term maintenance. And if you maintained your weight for the first two years in the registry, then you had even more chances of it maintaining it on the long term. And these people engage in different activities. They don't become Ironman runners. 76% of them will engage in walking as the main uh, physical activity. And I will skip that. If we look now at the... Uh, Canadian data. Some of you know that I work uh, for many years on an integrated uh, multi-level uh, obesity management system and we will focus this morning on uh, the regional specialized interdisciplinary obesity team. So uh, of course we're one of the few uh, interdisciplinary clinics uh, available freely in the public health care system. We had to uh, design uh, not so intensive intervention because uh, we didn't have so many resources and we wanted to help uh, more patients. So patients come to the clinic initially every six weeks and then less often. Uh, the objective is to have them self-manage their condition uh, and we're there to accompany them in progressive lifestyle, lifestyle optimization. So we have published a couple of results of uh, this type of intervention. This is, in fact, uh, one of our first papers on uh, people referred to the specialized obesity clinics. So you see the mean BMI is higher in that population, about 100 patients. And what maybe is different from uh, different lifestyle uh, interventions that you see in publications, because it's less intensive and progressive, you don't see the striking weight loss at six months, but you see progressive weight loss with, uh, in this situation, in this publication, 6.6 .6 kilos mean weight loss at uh, 12 months, with about half of the patient losing more than 5% of uh, their weight. And uh, when Daniel Bouchard was in our group as a postdoc, we had started to do that, and I'm trying to finish the uh, evaluation of long-term follow-up of uh, some of these patients. So these are 29 of 41 participants that we had in studies of prevention of diabetes, mostly. And we had them come back five years after the initial intervention to reevaluate them. So you see a little bit their profile. Of course, they are older at follow-up, <laughs> about five years. Most of them had diabetes or pre-diabetes, and the mean uh, BMI was around 30, 37 to start. So uh, it's very interesting to see that if you look at all the participants, whether or not they had initially lost weight, you see that they had initial weight loss as a mean in the first year, and then pretty good weight maintenance over the five years. Uh, but what really makes the difference is the patients who had initial response to the intervention. You see that those had uh, almost 9% weight loss with lifestyle intervention, and they kept it off pretty well with 7% weight loss after, after five years. And there was no effect of still attending or not the clinic. Often we say we need to do continuous follow-up in the specialized clinic. In our case, we try to have people to be uh, very uh, active in self-management. And we also, of course, do teaching and collaboration with primary care teams. So a lot of patients are, are followed by their primary care physician after a couple of years of follow-up. And this doesn't seem to have a deleterious effect compared to those who are still in the clinic. Of course, this is not a randomized uh, uh, follow-up or, or not in the clinic, but still gives you uh, a sense that this can be done on the long term. So my key messages for the second part is that uh, 
Weight loss maintenance is achieved by a majority of patients after successful lifestyle-induced weight loss. And that some behaviors and characteristics are associated with better weight loss maintenance like caloric intake, uh, low fat intake, food choices and behaviors. Uh, physical activity, of course, uh, this is a lot of physical activity that seems to be needed if you want to maintain the weight loss and self-monitoring of weight and, and some behaviors. And I thank you for your attention. much for a great talk. Uh, just a quick question about those individuals who maintain their weight loss in both look ahead and the, weight, the registry. You mentioned that decreased caloric intake played a role. I was wondering if there's anything physiologically different about those that made them able to actually maintain decreased caloric intake given what we know about the biologic response to weight loss with ghrelin and then cretin, et cetera. Yeah. That's a very interesting study. I don't think, I have not seen long-term data of the hormones of uh, satiety and hunger uh, in this uh, population after lifestyle intervention. However, in the National Weight Control Registry, they have had some of the patients come back to uh, do um, metabolic uh, rate testing and all that. And what they could see is that initially, rapidly after the weight loss, a lot of patients <coughs> had uh, uh, decreased metabolic rate, but that it, it was sustained in time only for about 15% of their patients in the National Weight Control Registry. Of course, it's not the 3,000 patients who, uh, who did the, those studies, but it was a subset of the patients. And I don't think we understand really well what's going on. Uh, and I don't think we understand neither um, the rate of weight loss versus the magnitude of compensatory mechanisms. Uh, and the, the things that were done to lose weight, but from the clinical perspective, I think it's always important to emphasize with our patients that what they're doing, they should be, you know, choosing to do it for the rest of their life. If they do it on the short term, it's doomed to fail. So it's better to do smaller <coughs> things, but sustainable. In French, we say, uh, pour être durable, il faut que ça soit endurable. Yeah. If you're following the schedule closely, we have a small change. Uh, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Sean Wharton, who I met at the very first Canadian Obesity Summit, now eight years ago. He's the medical director of the Wharton Medical Clinic, a community-based internal medicine, weight management, and diabetes clinic, really doing some uh, groundbreaking work there. He is an adjunct professor at McMaster University in Hamilton and York University in Toronto, please welcome Dr. Wharton to the podium. Okay, then. Just going to pull up my slides really quickly here. One second. Um, here it is. Great. Terrific. Thank you very much for my colleagues who have spoken before me and the ability to um, speak here. And um, I'm doing a radio um, interview um, after this on, on the report card. So um, thank you very much for allowing me to go, go first. Now, if we take a look at these, this concept of our patients losing weight and what they can possibly do afterwards, um, we know that a lot of patients regain weight and a lot of patients don't get to the weight loss that, that they're actually looking for or can actually benefit them. So what are some adjunct therapies that we could possibly give, give to, to um, these, the, these patients? Um, and these are my disclosures here. And um, there's uh, no commercial conflicts. 
and to mitigate um, my academic um, uh, uh, academic evidence will be pre presented based on the, 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 the disclosures that I have. So the objectives are to discuss the options in maintaining weight, weight loss um, or managing the weight regain that actually happens and we'll talk about the surgical interventions and also medication options. So this is some data that, ca that we published, um, published uh, um, um, uh, last year, looking at our clinic. We looked at 7,000 patients over seven and a half years. We didn't look at just what weight they started at and what weight they ended at, that would be just their weight loss, but we looked at what type of trajectory, what type of pattern the patients had. We threw all the data in and it came out with seven different patterns. Patients that either gained a little bit of weight, patients that were weight stable, um, patients that lost a little bit of weight, and patients that lost quickly, and then um, regain some, et cetera. There are seven different patterns. You can see the predominant pattern, though. And this is, these are all patients who just did lifestyle. There's no medications, there's no meal replacement, and there's no surgery here in, 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 in these patients. See that the majority of patients were in the minimal weight loss group, about 2.4%. This is an academic clinic where the dietitians, kinesiologists, counselors, um, internists, physicians, um, that's the best that we can do, which is pretty good. These p patients were gaining weight prior to coming to the clinic. But you can see that there's a small percentage of patients who actually lost a significant amount of weight, about 21% with a lifestyle modification. So some patients can actually do well. So my belief is that this data is, is um, that I believe that a lot of these people would like to be over here, certainly, but I certainly think that this is positive data. Um, and it does show that lifestyle modification is an effective treatment. It's the cornerstone. It's what I believe is the absolute cornerstone in all of our treatments. But can some of these patients do a little bit more? Those unfortunate ones who are actually gaining weight or those who remain weight stable, staying up at the 450 pound range and they're still 450 pounds, can they do a little bit better? Um, so um, as I said, lifestyle is the cornerstone and if we're going to add anything to, to lifestyle modification, it has to do a couple of things. One, it has to increase the number of patients that are responding to lifestyle. If three out of 100 respond to lifestyle, now medication or surgery has to take that up to 10, 20, or 30. Um, uh, it also has to increase the magnitude of the response. We know we can get weight loss with lifestyle modification, a small amount, so it's got to increase that from 3% up to 10, 20, 30%, or otherwise it's not worth actually doing. It's got to increase the duration. We know that people can lose weight over a short period of time or three, a couple of months, um, uh, the three-month time frame, but can we extend this with medications and surgery up to a year, five years, 10, 10 years? If we can't do that, then it's not worth using over lifestyle. Okay, we know that um, all of these options are going to cause a weight regain. Eventual weight regain happens. The question is, can we use multiple different options? Sometimes with, with um, can we add on top of lifestyle pharmacotherapy to push this down and keep it going on a little further? And me, maybe even with surgery, and uh, we know with surgery, weight comes back, but can we jump on to with pharmacotherapy and push this a, 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 um, uh, further? So looking at the most effective treatment, the gold standard, everybody knows that, that bariatric surgery is the gold standard. It decreases weight. The three most effective are the root and wide gastric bypass, the sleeve gastrectomy, and the BPD surgery. Those are our effective weight loss surgeries. Um, um, what is not effective is the lap band. So we've learned this recently, and we actually, we actually know about this. The, the, it's the concept of how how it's such an effective treatment, particularly for metabolic conditions like diabetes. We know that on the day of surgery, you actually stop your diabetes meds, you stop your insulin, particularly if your diabetes is under a 10-year time frame of actually having it. So how does this, this actually work for the surgeries that were effective, the ones that we talked about previously? So the hindgut theory is that this is a gastric bypass here. And you can see what happens is, is that semi-digested food bypasses the stomach, hits the ileum, the ileum is where the L cells live. The L cells are the incretin cells. You get a release of GLP-1 and GIP that goes to the pancreas and wakes up the pancreas, shakes it, and says it's time to actually work. Um, and that's why on the day of surgery, diabetes medications stop. Also, that GLP-1 goes up to the brain, tells the brain how to eat properly. I think we need to let our patients know that a lot of what happens in bariatric surgery is not the physical components of the, of the, re, of the, of the restrictive nature of it, although that's an aspect of it, uh, but a lot of it is the hormonal changes, and that's likely why lap band surgery doesn't work and the other surgeries do work, because they induce a neuro a neurohormonal aspect. 
and we know this because um, Sue, Sue Peterson, um, who is going to be here today, today sh um, did this study a while back showing a post-meal test after Roux-en-Y gastric bypass surgery. All the good hormones went up. GLP-1, PYY, CCK, and the bad hormones went down, ghrelin. So we know it's actually true. So what about other treatment options? Um, can we look at, because again, bariatric surgery is the last resort. It's the last resort. Um, can we do other things prior to that? It's the best treatment, but the last resort. So medications in Canada, we have two. Orlistat, and, um, and introduced in 1999, and Glutide introduced in 2015. Um, now let's talk, and in the States, they have six. We've got two, they have six. And so um, there are ahead of the curve here, and the majority of these medications work in the hypothalamus. They work in the brain. Phentermine works in the brain. Orlistat is the only one that doesn't have the neurohormonal aspects to it. This combination works in the brain. Lord, these all do. So let's talk a little bit about that concept. So Orlistat, we know, s decreases the absorption of dietary fat. So 30% of dietary fat is decreased, and that's even the good fats, the omega-3s, the fats from salmon, et cetera. So it can be a challenge at times, but we but we do see a decrease in weight. It's a deterrent type of medication. So in the clinical trials, we saw a significant amount of, of weight coming down. In the actual clinical practice, we don't see a 10% decrease in weight. We see approximately a 3% decrease in weight over and above the lifestyle options. So if you can lose 3% by, by yourself, you add another 3% by adding on this medication if, if you can tolerate it. And so we took a look at that. We took a look, in at, at, we took a look at the data to see how many people can tolerate it, how many people are actually on it. There's very little clinical data out there. So we decided to do our own data and look at our patients. We asked 507, 16 patients, have you ever taken Orlistat? Since it's the only medication that was around for a long time, this was a surprise to us. 46 said yes, 468 said no. Are we maybe doing a disservice by not offering it to them? Do we think the side effect profile is too much of a problem? Maybe people with, with constipation may be able to do well with, 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 with this medication. Um, so to um, a certain degree, did the patients lose weight on it? And those patients that had taken it, they were on it for about seven, to eight, seven almost eight, eight months, which is a surprise to me. I thought it would be shorter, um, but there's a variability here. And then the weight loss was actually pretty good. And so those who can tolerate it maybe should actually get it. But again, to me, it is a deterrent type of medication, and I think that um, we can do, um, we can have medications that are a little bit better. Main side effect, again, diarrhea and the GI side effects. So let's take a look at, quote unquote, smarter medications. Um, can we have medications that follow the biological principles? Meyer Franz talked very eloquently about the biological principles that dictate weight regain and the inability to keep weight off over the long term. I believe that medications have to follow those same type of biological principles um, at, uh, and work in, in the, 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 the hypothalamus. At the current time, we only have one medication in Canada, and this is the GLP-1 analog. Um, and so as we stated, as you decrease your caloric intake or you decrease weight, GLP-1 drops. That's a bad thing. So can we possibly increase your, your, your GLP-1? The number one way to increase your GLP-1 is bariatric surgery. The number two way would be to take GLP-1. And this is a clinical trial that, um, that um, uh, our clinic par, um, um, par, 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 par participated in. If you look at, so this trial is looking at patients who lost weight um, through lifestyle modification. Just work a little bit harder, do, do the right things over a period of time, we know people can actually lose weight. So you lose about 6% of, uh, of, of your weight here, but at this point is where you start to, uh, to, to tank. Your motivation decreases, your GLP-1 ends up going down. This is the weight regain time. At this point, we introduce the medication. With the introduction of the medication, we see a further decrease in weight, and the placebo medication here, weight stays relatively stable. To me, this, this line, I expected this line, because it's a true medication, it's GLP-1, it should work, um, but this line was surprising to me, the, the placebo line. I expected that to be a V-shaped curve, but the placebo showed that, that you can maintain weight by intensity of, of having um, that intense process of working, working, working at it. Um, 
And so, but certainly that adjunct is there. So we looked at our own clinic. So in Canada, how well is liraglutide doing? Because that was the clinical trial. So we see here at, at, at our clinic, we looked at 434 patients taking the medication. At the three month time frame, you're getting about a 4% weight loss. And at the 12 month time frame, about an 8% weight loss. So that's what we saw in the clinical trials also, about an 8% weight loss with liraglutide. And greater than 5% weight loss um, at 12 months, greater than 60% of patients had decreased greater than, greater than 5, greater than 5 per, per percent. So this is a good adjunct on top of lifestyle. Um, what was the variability? This is fascinating to me. So we looked at 100 patients at, at our clinic, and you can see these, these are the patients that lost the most amount of weight, the patients on the right-hand side of the curve. As we go to the left-hand side, you can see that these patients also on 3 milligrams worth of Saxenda didn't do so well, and these guys gained weight. The variability is fascinating. Who is going to lose on the medication, who isn't? We don't really know. It's a bit of a crapshoot. You just have to give it to the patient and hope for the best. If they're the responder, awesome. If they're not, then it's not the medication for them. It may not be the mechanism by which they are gaining weight or regaining weight. It may be a PYY, a CCK, a ghrelin mechanism, a, a something else completely different, an addiction type of thing, um, a food addiction. Um, uh, but, but for those who respond, GLP-1 seems to be their, their, their major challenge. So in, in con 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 conclusion, um, lifestyle uh, management, I believe, is the cornerstone. I believe that we can't do anything without it. If you don't have a good dietary approach, a good physical approach, a good counseling approach, um, emotional understanding of this, this medical condition, don't bother doing it. This is your cornerstone. In bariatric surgery, we know in the long term, for certainly for diabetes, it's the, it's the, the successful treatment. It's um, bar none. Um, uh, the, uh, one of the most important things we can do for patients who have significantly elevated BMIs, particularly if comorbid conditions are also there. Medications are, are effective, they're promising, they're on the horizon, and I think that it's a, it's a great adjunct for people who are struggling. Uh, so in conclusion, um, weight regain post-lifestyle management can be managed with medications or surgery. All treatments can eventually lead to weight regain. We have to work on this and mitigate it. That's why the lifestyle modification and continued being to be seen at a clinic and followed up is important. And mitigating weight, weight regains can, uh, can be challenging. And uh, we, still need, we still need research. Thank you very much. So there, there is time for questions. If there's questions, I'll ask one though, for the sake of the clinicians in the audience who might not be using liraglutide that frequently, can you comment about the most common side effects? Yes, the most common side effects bar none are the GI side effects and nausea. So 44% of the patients in the clinical trials had some degree of nausea. May that be really bad nausea where they had to stop it, which was about 4% of the patients or just some degree of nausea. So most people say, if you don't get nausea, you're not taking it to some degree. That's why, that's how many people actually get it. But, but 60% or in our trial, 56% had no side effects, which is shocking to me. I always expect them to have some degree of nausea, but some of them said, no, everything was great. It was fine. So, and that's a greater number of patients that said everything is fine. But 44% did have nausea. Some get some diarrhea, um, uh, belching, um, that, that type of thing. But it goes away after, after a period of time. And the majority of people are able to stay on the medication long term. Great overview, Sean. Um, are you aware as to whether any of those other medications from the U.S. will be coming to Canada? Right. So I think that the medications that have fentramine in them will take longer to come to Canada. We have this negative view of fentramine, which I think is wrong. Um, so I think that Health Canada has a negative view of it. So the combination of medications with fentramine will take longer. But the other ones, I think will end up coming here. As a matter of fact, um, Contrave, which is a combination of naltrexone and bu and bu bupropion, bupropion, the antidepressant um, uh, medication, has just got, I think yesterday, um, uh, an approval status, one of the approval statuses. They go through various different ones. They got like the first one, which is going to take a, a, next, a next step. But that's going to be interesting because it's kind of an addiction type of thing. Two addiction medications. So food addiction, if you believe in food addiction as part of your issue or part of your problem, this medication may be the one that may be able to help that entire picture. 
Oh, sorry, we have one person in front of you and then we can. Oh, oh please go, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I have some patients on neuroglutide 3 milligrams and they do very well for s let's say three months, six months. Is there a, a time when when you can give a holiday for these uh, medications because they cost like 400 bucks a month? And I do. I do anything. I do anything the patient wants. I do whatever. So on the, on the yeah, patient wants to decrease it because it's costing them too much because they're paying out of pocket. I decrease it. Patients want to take a holiday. I tell them, let, why don't we take a holiday and let's work on this. You're going to come back and see me. Come back and see me regularly. We'll always talk about it. We'll always move the medication in the positive positive di direction and we'll get you back, 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 back on track. I have no problem with, with holidays. That's not in the product monograph, but I would do it if they want to do it. But is there evidence? No, but you can go for it. I have to be a grouch, I'm sorry, but grab Sean right now while I do the introduction and uh, <laughs> you can ask the question, okay? So thanks, thanks Sean very much. Oh, and here, uh, which one is yours? Yeah. So, our last speaker for this session is Dr. Marie-Philippe Moran. She's the recipient of the Governor General's Academic Medal of Canada. She works as a general internal medicine specialist at the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute and is assistant professor affiliated to Laval University. Everybody, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Moran. Okay, so good morning everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So like Marie-France, I will practice my English today. So um, <coughs> I'm also doing a, a bariatric medicine fellowship at the University of Ottawa. So um, So for my disclosure, um, excuse me, the slides doesn't change on the computer. Can you just come here? Sorry. The slide doesn't change. Change here, but doesn't change here. Okay. Doesn't work. It changed here, but doesn't change here. Sorry.
Uh, we'll start the presentation. Uh, I cannot change the slide over there. I don't know what's going on. Um, so I will start my presentation uh, without the slides, so you won't see any slides. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay, oh, it's changing, that was changing. So uh, I will start. So meal replacement, uh, for my, I don't have any uh, disclosure, uh, no commercial support for this presentation. And all information in this presentation is presented as best evidence and also from practical clinical experience. So the objective of the presentation is to understand what is a meal replacement and what's the rationale using meal replacement. Also to understand the difference between a full versus a partial meal replacement strategy We'll review the evidence in the literature supporting the use of mere replacement for weight maintenance. And also we'll try to evaluate the benefits of using medication after weight loss with a meal replacement strategy. So for introduction, obesity is a chronic complex and multifactorial disease. And in North America, 66% of the population are in the overweight category and uh, 25 to 30% of the population have obesity. And we all know that five to 10% weight loss can improve cardiovascular risk factor, but typically more than 50% of the people who initially lose weight regain 45 to 75% of the weight within 12 to 30 months. And the main option for weight maintenance are mainly uh, diet, exercise, medication, and meal replacement. So what is a meal replacement? So a meal replacement uh, comes in a wide variety of products. It can be a uh, protein shake, so liquid meal replacement can be a protein bar, can be a homemade protein shake too. And uh, usually based on some, um, uh, on, on the American uh, Diet Dietetic Association, it do not exceed 300 kilocalorie per portion. And the calorie from fat are usually under 30%, and the protein should be over uh, 15 grams, uh, really to replace a meal. And usually it's vitamin and mineral fortify, and it, contai it contain also non-nutritive sweeteners. So there's two types of meal replacement. The first one is a full meal replacement, or what we call a low-calorie diet, and the second one is a partial meal replacement. So we'll talk a little bit of full meal replacement. So full meal replacement is a strategy for weight loss. It's not a strategy for weight maintenance. And patient on a full meal replacement must be medically monitored and should participate in a multidisciplinary lifestyle program to learn about the long-term weight management and maintenance. And in Canada, full meal replacement is approved for a low calorie diet of at least 900 kilocalorie per day. And in the US, a full meal replacement is approved uh, for a very low calorie diet of at least 800 kilocalorie per day. And full meal replacement needs to meet L Canada regulation. So uh, at the, the Ottawa Hospital Weight Management Clinic and at the LEAF Weight Management Clinic, we have a total of six month program medically supervised with weekly lifestyle intervention group sessions uh, with dietitians, psychologists, behaviorists, kinesiologists. And during the first six or 12 weeks of, meal of the program, you have full meal replacement. Uh, so Optifast, um, so Optifast can also, it's uh, the product that the, the surgical program use uh, several weeks before bariatric surgery to shrink the liver. And uh, there's also weekly appointment with the doctors uh, because uh, we need to adjust the insulin, uh, the diabetes improve, we have to adjust the medication for high blood pressure, for cholesterol, and the eligibility is a BMI over 30 with comorbidities. And at that kind of program, the most important part is the lifestyle intervention. Uh, because basically meal replacement is only a tool to get the weight down, but after that, the most important thing is the lifestyle intervention group session. And that's really important that patients understand that. Uh, so 
the full mirror placement is really a tool to break the vicious cycle of obesity. So um, I will show you in the next slide what's the vicious cycle of obesity. But full mirror placement can result in uh, a 15 to 20% weight loss. And with OptiFast 4 Shake a Day, uh, here it gives you an example. It's a 900 kilocalorie uh, per day, 90 grams of protein, uh, 30 grams of lipid, and 67.2 grams of carbs, with a total allowance of vitamin and minerals. So what's the vicious cycle of obesity? Um, I will tell you the story of one of my patients that I've a few years before I met him. So uh, the name of my patient is Mr. X. So Mr. X was a patient with a class one obesity with a BMI at 33.2, ES stage zero. And over the years, he gained around 20 pounds because he had a sedentary and an hypercaloric diet. And uh, he became to have a class two obesity and the BMI goes up to 35.9 and he was diagnosed with type two diabetes by the, the primary care physician. So uh, the insulin was added and uh, he continued to have a the, 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 the sedentary and uh, lifestyle and the hypercaloric diet, and he gained another 15 pounds. So the BMI goes up to 38, and he develops a severe knees, osteoarthritis, and back pain. And he went to see a, an orthopedic surgeon, but he couldn't have any knee replacement because he had to lose weight before. So uh, he was put on disability, secondary to pain. Uh, he was unable to work, unable to move. Lyrica was uh, added because he had pain, and he gained another 25 pounds over the years. So the BMI goes up to 41.4, and he tried to lose weight, but it was unsuccessful, uh, and the depression was diagnosed by the family doctor. So ketiapine and paroxetine was added, and he started to have an emotional eating pattern, and the diabetes get worse, so the insulin was increased, and he gained another 25 pounds. And then I was referred to the weight management clinic, uh, and at that time, he had a class 3 obesity with a BMI 44.8, ES stage 0, type 2 diabetes, depression, and disability secondary to knee and back pain or osteoarthritis. So you see the pattern and the vicious cycle of obesity. So I met him, um, and, but he was ineligible for surgery because he smoked cigarettes at that time. Uh, so we enrolled him in a six-month medical program with a total meal replacement for 12 weeks. And the starting weight was uh, 330 pounds and he lost around 66 pounds. Uh, that represents a 20% weight loss. And he was able to add the bilateral knee replacement, I the back pain decreased, he was able to exercise and to follow the lifestyle intervention learned during the program. The A1C improved, uh, the A1C uh, started at 8.8% and goes down to 7.3%. We were able to decrease the lentus down to 20 units. It was previously at 110 units. We stopped completely the Novo Rapid and we were able to add metformin and Jardins uh, to manage um, uh, diabetes with pills only. Uh, we stopped the, the Lyrica because the pain improved. We stopped the ketiapine and we changed the paroxetine for Wellbutrin to promote a little bit the more the weight loss. So uh, this is an example of how we can manage a patient with a partial mirror placement. Of course, this patient is at risk of weight regain. Uh, but we fo th I think that the, 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 the secret is uh, the lifestyle intervention and also the follow-up uh, after that. Um, so this is for the full mirror replacement part. So what are partial mirror replacements? So partial mirror replacement is a tool for weight loss or weight maintenance. And partial mirror replacement can be used after a full mirror replacement to um, continue to uh, maintain the weight loss. And usually it replaces one or two meals per day or snacks and are a part of a low calorie diet with a uh, regular food. Um, so um, I, sh I have a table with uh, all the meal replacement who uh, compare, but you cannot see, I will skip this part. So the rationale of using partial meal replacement for weight maintenance, uh, really it increases uh, the estimation of portion and it provides also a good nutrition with uh, limited calories. I will show you a few studies in the uh, next slides. Also, it provides a structured diet and prevent meal skipping patterns. So uh, if you have a uh, patient, if you, you do assessment uh, for patients who have obesity, you know that a lot of patients skip breakfast, skip lunch, and that's really challenging for them to start having breakfast. So instead of having nothing, partial meal replacement can be a solution for, for these people. It's also useful for people with busy schedule. A lot of people have to travel. A lot of people have to eat out. 
uh, because of their work. So having partial meal replacement strategy instead of going to the restaurant can be a solution for people who want to ma maintain their weight loss. But um, before using partial meal replacement, as I said, the, the, the most important part is uh, the association of healthy diet and exercise. It's always the basics. Because if you uh, don't do this and you have uh, one, one meal replacement per day, and you eat junk food the rest of the day, then you won't be successful. Th so the basics is always healthy diet and exercise. So uh, there's uh, a lot of protein uh, usually in meal replacement. We all know that protein increase satiety, uh, increase also uh, the, the, ter the thermogenesis, and also help preserving lean body mass and maintaining uh, resting energy expenditure. So <coughs> I have a study here, 117 patients, uh, a study in Australian studies, uh, 117 patient mean age 70 years old, so in the elderly population, were randomized into three groups. So the first group was only general advice about exercise and healthy eating advice based on the Australian food guide. Uh, the second one was uh, exercise with hypocaloric uh, diet, uh, 500 kilocalorie deficit with follow-up with dietitian. And the third group was exercise with uh, two or three meal replacement per day with uh, one meal per day. And they checked uh, the weight loss and the percent fat mass loss. And the weight loss in the group three, so with the partial meal replacement, was 11.1% uh, uh, versus around 5% with uh, group uh, two and group one, 3.7%. Uh, and the fat mass loss was 16.8%. And they also look uh, at the, the ratio of fat mass loss versus lean mass loss. And they found that every time in that study, a uh, patient lose around one kilograms of fat mass, they lost around 0 0.32 kilograms of lean mass loss in the group three with partial meal re replacement regimen. And that was around the same with uh, the lifestyle intervention alone, uh, one kilograms per uh, of fat mass loss uh, for 0 0.33 kilograms of lean man mass loss. That, so that was uh, really the same. And they also checked the nutritional status of the patient. And uh, they also, uh, by the albumin level, we all know that the albumin level is not the best way to uh, check the nutrition status, but they did that in that study. So uh, in group three, with the partial meal replacement, the albumin level increased by 2.6%. So it's really reassuring to see that um, there's no uh, fall in the albumin level. And also the vitamin D, the vitamin B12, and the ferritin increase in the group with partial meal replacement regimen and stay stable with the, the group with um, food. So do meal replacement provide good nutrition? This is look at trial. Uh, so look at trial is a randomized control trial with type two diabetes. They were randomized in two groups. So the first group was a low uh, calorie di uh, diet, uh, but they were allowed to take meal replacement during the first um, 20 weeks. They were allowed to take two meal replacement uh, for a meal and one or two uh, meal replacement for snacks. And during the week 20 to 52, they were allowed to take one meal as a, uh, one meal replacement as a meal and one snack uh, per day uh, with meal rep replacement. And uh, they had a goal for exercise and they had lifestyle group session. And the control group was about general information about diet and exercise uh, via three group session per year. And they uh, looked at the diet at 12 months uh, between uh, the two groups. So the diet at, um, at the beginning of the study was similar uh, uh, between groups, but at 12 months, uh, they found that a patient on a partial meal replacement uh, increased their consumption of fruit, veggies, and uh, dairy product, uh, decreased their daily servings of uh, carbs, and uh, decreased also uh, the percent energy from fat. And the greater percent patient meeting the dietary recommendation were those consuming more than two meal replacement per day. So it's really reassuring that uh, you can have a good quality diet and having uh, one or two meal replacement per day. They also look in the look at study the factors associated with success. So at year one, as Mar Marie France say, um, they lost around 8.6 kilograms in the lifestyle intervention group versus 0 0.7 kilogram for the control group. And they look at the, the factor associated with success to weight loss and weight maintenance. And they found that physical activity, treatment attendance, and consumption of meal replacement were the three factors associated uh, for success of weight loss and weight maintenance at one year. And patient in the highest quartile of meal replacement used had a four times greater odds of reaching 7% weight loss. So more weight loss and more weight maintenance uh, with meal replacement. 
I have another study here of uh, weight management. It's a meta-analysis from six studies, a uh, total of 487 patients. And uh, they look at the dropout rate at one year uh, on patients who were on a, a, a diet with food versus patients who were on a partial meal replacement regimen with food. And the dropout rate at one year was 47% uh, for the partial meal replacement group versus 64% with the control group. So that means that uh, really uh, partial meal replacement uh, can be very useful for some people to help uh, maintaining um, the, the lifestyle change and maintaining the, the dietary change. Um, the last study I want to show you is the, is the scale maintenance randomized studies. Um, so it's uh, studies with 422 patients. And they were randomized between liraglutide versus placebo. But before randomization, uh, they had to lose more than 5% weight loss by a low calorie diet. And also they were allowed to take up to three meal replacement per day. And the mean weight loss during the run-in period was around 6.3 kilograms. And after that, they were randomized between liraglutide and placebo, but they were not allowed to take any meal replacement. And at week, um, so, so, so they, they look um, uh, the, the additional weight loss. So with liraglutide, there was an additional weight loss of 6.2% uh, versus 0.2% for placebo and 81.4% maintain over 5% weight loss maintenance uh, on liraglutide. So that it means so that after a meal replacement regimen, having medication to help uh, the weight maintenance uh, can be uh, very useful uh, for this population. And in our clinical experience, sometimes we have a partial meal replacement regimen and we add liraglutide at the same times but I didn't find any studies to show you a uh, result about uh, meal replacement and liraglutide at the same time. So in conclusion, uh, full meal replacement programs are effective for weight loss and really can break the vicious cycle of obesity. Uh, partial meal replacement are a very effective tool for weight loss and for weight maintenance in addition to lifestyle modification. So always, uh, lifestyle modification is always the basics. And it provides uh, portion control, calorie control, and a good structure eating. And uh, it, it can uh, gives you a good nutritional values and a low good quality diet. And a liraglutide after weight loss with meal replacement can result in more weight loss and assist with weight maintenance. So at the end, obesity is a chronic disease. And whatever the strategy used for weight maintenance, uh, medication, exercise, diet, meal replacement. I think that long-term follow-up and adaptation of the strategy for uh, our patient remain the most important things. I'm not telling you that partial meal replacement is the, the answer for all the patient, but I think that for some patient, if we choose the, the, the right patient, uh, I think it uh, can be a, a good tool. Um, in, in our field, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of tools to help patient. Uh, we have medication, exercise, diet, meal replacement, and bariatric surgery. So I think we have to, to, to keep uh, our mind open to every strategy and use the, the best strategy uh, for uh, the best patient and adapt our strategy for our patient. Thank you. We owe you extra thanks for working with such grace <laughs> under difficult conditions. Thank you. Do we have questions for, uh, f for, the, for the speaker? So thank you, Marie-Philippe. Um, my question is, are, is there any research on, on the psychosocial impacts of being, people being on meal replacement diets, um, in particular like social isolation or disordered eating? Um, we uh, work with um, Dr. Besada in Ottawa with um, a specialist in eating disorder. And one of the recommendation when he treats patient with eating disorder like bin binge eating disorder is um, uh, usually to enroll them in a, in a program, a structure program to help them. Uh, but of course, um, we like that people with binge eating disorder 
um, have uh, a treatment before, like a follow-up with a psychiatrist, maybe having a little bit of violence, uh, before starting program with meal replacement, because after that they are at risk of weight regain. But um, really, uh, meal replacement can be really helpful for this population. Um, but I didn't see any studies about that. Um, but of course, uh, binge eating uh, meal replacement can uh, be really helpful for um, binge eating disorder uh, in our my clinical experience. Um, the other part of the, quest the question was the impact of, of the psychological uh, factors. Of course, it's a really hard program when you're on a full meal replacement for six weeks or 12 weeks. So four shake a day with no food, it's really, really hard. And that's why we have weekly session and weekly session with the doctor to have psychological support for this patient. Um, and that's really uh, difficult also uh, for uh, people with their family because uh, a lot of our social life is ar around food. So it's really difficult for, for a patient and that's why we um, support them uh, with the group. Any other question? <laughs>